So, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming this morning to uh, the history of video games, or more correctly, a brief history of home video game systems and major developments, developments in electronic hardware and software over the past 50 years. Because I'm fond of that whole 1800s trend of having excessively long subtitles, and I realized as soon as I submitted the uh, panel application that doing the entire history of video games would be impossible. There's far too much to cover over 50 years. And so I decided, well, generally speaking, what do we play games on? Some kind of home console. So why not focus on that? So, let's get to it. It's always slow on the earworks over there. Uh, what are you gonna learn here? Learn the general history of home video game market over the past 50 years, I'm gonna try to cover as best I can, the more notable details of a console, you know, reasons why they did really good in the market, reasons why some of them failed, and a lot of it will just be my, I'm not going to say my opinion on such, I mean, I'll try to share facts where applicable, but I'll throw in my thoughts on something here and there, because I've pretty much been playing games since I can remember, and I've been interested in the technology and the history, so you build up a wealth of knowledge, you know, all of you are hot fans of something, have hobbies in something, you know, got One Piece cosplayers, they probably tell me everything possible about it. Got a Wonder Woman right here, come on. So, you know, we all know having that really good knowledge on stuff. Um, I'd love to provide audio and video samples, but time limits really make it a bad idea. Part of it was, last year I didn't have um, access to audio equipment in my panel, so I didn't plan around it, but this year, apparently I do, but, well, what you gonna do? Time constraints don't really make it a major problem. Uh, they also limit how far I can go into details on stuff, so this ironically is probably taking up more time than any given console will, go figure. Um, so I will bypass this stuff, just take it for what it is. If you know I skip something, there's probably a reason for it for time constraints, so just bear with me. And this will end up being kind of a fast paced presentation. But the whole point is, as I was saying, I love video game culture, technology, what's made, the history. And I just kind of wanted to share that to those of you who are interested. Um, I don't want to be your prime source for the knowledge. Uh, I want to sort of plant a seed so that if you want to go out and look up this, you know, you see a console you've never heard of and think, huh, I'm curious about that, that you'll have at least a little info to go and sort of look it up yourself. You know, always sparking that bit of interest for those of you coming here who are already interested enough. Um, and just try to save all questions till the end because I want to make sure I can at least get through everything and then go. Uh, but last year I had some hijacking going on in my thread. It was fun. So, uh, good old question time. Which is one time I'll really ask y'all a question. What do you think is the first proper video game? I can't remember what it's called, but there was a thing where there was like a a screen or something painted on it, and there was a light behind the screen, and you could manipulate the light with like control. Uh, I can't, and, and you could move the light to various targets that had been painted on the screen. You're talking about like the turn, early turn of like the 19th, 20th century kind of arcade stuff. Right. Good. Good. What you described sounded like either Space War or maybe in the early 10th or two. Also good answers. Most people usually will of course say Pong, but obviously I'm dealing with a well-educated audience here, so you guys uh, rock. Not to say that Pong is a bad answer, it would make sense, but um, it's kind of it's a trick question because as you can see from the couple answers we've got here, no one can really agree. It really depends on how you define video game, and a lot of people want to get technical on it being a typical display as we think of it, setting a video output and being some kind of electronic game played on that, so like a little light manipulation thing wouldn't really qualify as video game because it's not doing video, it's just a light being shown. First, those radar equipment type games like Tennis for Two, they're using oscilloscope technology to draw it, so people want to get technical about it, but for us, some kind of electronic game, good enough of a definition, right? So, and of course it's updated for you, but it won't for me. Um, and yes, I decided to give corny act titles to everything, so just roll with it. Um, very early days of computing, skilled programmers took to experimenting with the new computers of the time, all these large mainframe systems, basically deciding to sort of stress test them, thinking, hmm, what can we do with this? 
and everyone likes games. All through human history, we've invented some kind of game, some entertainment. So these guys were taking, you know, multi-million, multi-billion dollar, you know, one-of-a-kind machines and writing games for them. I'd do it too if I was back in the 50s. Um, but any of these machines, again, were one-of-a-kind. And the thing about them is they, they were not like the computers we think of today. They weren't microprocessors. Your memory wasn't in nice little chips that you just socketed in there and it worked. Everything was pretty much hand-coded, I mean. I can't even really describe it to you, but there is something else. Um, so a perfect example of this kind of equipment is Space War. Uh, it's not the best screenshot. Some of the screenshots I got aren't going to be that great. Forgive me. You really can't find as many pictures as you think of these things. You can find recreations. You're trying to find pictures that look authentic is its own thing. Um, space War, this being the 50s into the 60s, everyone's thinking about space. You know, all the B movies back in the 50s. What? Alien invasions, or the occasional block attack. Um, so you've got these games where you know they're using computers designed for physics to calculate missile trajectories. Why not use them for a little space combat game? It makes sense, but how many people really understand orbital mechanics and the physics of space? Pretty much have to work in the field. So yeah, these things were pretty much left to their own one-off fields. Um, so that was a quick little introduction to how these things decided to get going, why they decided, you know, let's make computer games. Uh, we've got the beginnings of the consumer game market. Of course, we have one of the Pong advertisements from the 70s where you got to have your, uh, what's it, Price is right S model thanks to a machine that looks like some robot from some rejected Star Wars concept art. Um, start off with a couple of notable examples from the very early days, still running on this mainframe idea. We have Galaxy Game, which is technically the first mass-produced video game, and one of the first coin-operated video game using the strict definition of video games, released in early 1971, based on the Space War concept from the 1960s. Only one unit was actually produced, and that was installed at Stanford University, and there were upgrades made to allow multiple people to play together on various dumb terminals. So they were their own terminals that linked up to the main unit doing all the work. So you have multiple people playing, think like some of the sit down racing cabinets today where you know, four people can all be on one on separate machines, but the one machine is handling everything. I'm sure a lot of you know basic dumb terminal stuff, but yeah. It didn't take off though, it just stayed there. They weren't able to really sell units. So the next major attempt was computer space, which is also a version of space war. You tell people back then really like space? Uh, also released in 1971, this was the first real attempt, attempt to like really try to bring the game to the masses. They built it as, okay, this is a game we're going to set up like you think of a traditional arcade game. Build a cabinet, got its own computer in there, doing the work, and it failed in the market because of the complex game mechanics. I mean, you've got regular everyday people walking up to a machine that, we're talking about space, orbital physics, no, it didn't click. So that went nowhere, but uh, of note, it was created by Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney. Uh, Nolan Bushnell is a name some of you will probably recognize, and we'll get to him shortly. But moving on, we're in 1971 now. We head on to Ralph Baer, Magnavox, and the Brown Box. Ralph Baer uh, worked as an electrical engineer, had an idea since the early 50s for an electronic game system that would hook up to a normal television set rather than being a dedicated, you know, computer mainframe system or some kind of standalone arcade cabinet as we think of it. He was able to develop a prototype in the late 60s that was eventually picked up by Magnavox, a major television manufacturer at the time, uh, to be mass marketed and sold. This prototype is the legendary Brown Box. Uh, it played just a variety of basic ball and paddle based games on an old consumer television set. It just used a couple of knobs to control where the paddles would go, had a basic ball option, very simple physics, very simple logic, but that was the beauty of it. Anyone could pick up and play. Any of us who have played Pong, you instantly figure it out. There's no contest to it. That guy. Uh, built up into the Magnavox Odyssey, which is considered the first home video game console. There certainly wasn't anything in the home market before it, but calling a video game kind of iffy. Uh, this was released in August of 1972. Now, to give you an idea on the time frame we're talking, this is when we were still landing on the moon. 
So you think about that. You'll think about the space program that was far back. You don't think of video games going that far back in Odyssey in 72. It starts to click how long this stuff has been going on. It used a system of interchangeable cards which changed what game was being played. But all they did was change what bit of end logic was being applied. So if you change from card one to card four, it would switch it from sort of a Pong-like game to, here yeah, we're getting feedback, to um, something that'd be like, let's say, basketball. And I mean that loosely, where more of you push a button and it makes the ball fall. It's, I wish I could do video to show you, but yeah. Um, the system had no sound. We think of sound is a common thing with video games. No sound, no beeps, no blips, no nothing. And like I said, people loosely call it a video game. It came with a lot of accessories. A lot of accessories. It was really more like a board game that used your TV for some functionality depending on the game. There's a haunted house game where I don't even actually understand the rules. I've read the rule sheet and I don't get it. Um, there's your basic table tennis games. There's um, a football game that used dice and like uh, seriously a calculation table like D and D for windage and such. And at some point, the Odyssey and its two paddles and a ball get used somewhere in there. So I don't know. It's hard to figure out. But without having all the equipment sitting in my room, these things are expensive, especially when we. You know, what can you do? But um, in Lightning Graphics, it actually used overlays that stuck to the uh, CRT TV, you know, the big two TVs. That actually kind of works. I have a homebrew Odyssey game, one that people have made recently, and I've played around with it, at least by sticking the cling on the TV. I get the idea they were going for, but yeah, coming from the generation we're in, it, it just seems cheap. But that was the first implementation at the time. You didn't have the ability to just make complex game consoles back then, not to something to buy in that small. Um, the problem is the system didn't quite do well because the average consumer, it's kind of funny with branding. It being a Magnavox product, people thought that you could only use it on a Magnavox TV. And so if you had an RCA TV or any other brand, people, a lot of people thought it might not work with it, so why buy it? So, even though they tried to advertise works on any television, it kind of flopped, but it was pretty pricey at its time, so what do you expect? And uh, one last thing of note is that it did have an add-on uh, shooting gallery game that used a light gun that looks like an actual hunting rifle. You know, today we have the guns that don't even look like guns, and back in, when we were younger, the zapper got changed from gray to orange. Now this thing looks like a rifle. So, go figure. Um, wouldn't fly today, but hey, awesome. So, Odyssey just kind of went nowhere. So we're going to have Atari come into the scene. Uh, we got Nolan Bushnell, creator of Computer Space, wanted to make a new game for a mass distribution. And the story goes, he had gone to a trade show in the early 70s and saw the brown box slash Odyssey in action and took the idea for a tennis game. Um, that game kind of became legendary, and we've already mentioned it before. Pong. That's worth noting, uh, real quick, the reason I had that picture of Nolan Bushnell where he had uh, Chuck E. Cheese with him. That is related to the origins of Atari. All I'm going to say is I strongly recommend you do look up Atari, read the Wikipedia article at least on its history. He did a lot of clever stuff to make money to get that company going. I mean, if there's anyone who had a passion for gaming back before it was even a thing, it'd be Nolan Bushnell. So we move on to Pong, which was released in mid to late 1972. It was originally set up in a local bar in uh, California called Andy Caps. The story goes that within the first few days of the machine being there, the bar owner gets sent a service call saying, hey, the machine's not working, it's acting up, you need to come fix this thing or get it out of here. So, Bushnell was expecting it to be another computer space, something that failed, or the machine itself was just bugged. He goes in, the thing's jammed with quarters. Full. <laughs> Can't hold anymore. People try sticking quarters in, it just it falls out. So, it did surprisingly well, and that'd be due to the simplicity of it, which is probably why we think of Pong as the first game, because it's the first one that really caught on. It's the first one that was available to everybody. So, he knew he had a hit going. 
And so he slowly started you know, getting more and more machines made, taking out loans, working to push this game out there. And it took off. Now Magnavox did eventually sue Atari over Pong because the idea was basically stolen from the Odyssey. They were like, hey, we had to take it to this game first. You stole it. Atari eventually settled out of court with Magnavox, so that at least had a happy ending. Which also resulted in the home Pong consoles. So, home versions began being released in 1974. They mainly were the traditional Pong game, but later versions had more game variants with multiple paddles or alternate rules. You have pairs of paddles that would be like a hockey or a football game, smaller uh, scoring areas rather than the full get it to the end of the screen. You know, if you can imagine a variation of Pong, it existed. Uh, Breakout is just an evolution of Pong as an example of how far that game can go. Uh, these were really popular in the home, just like the arcade machines, due to the simplicity of the game compared to other game ideas out there. And this led to Pong clones. Hundreds of them. These are just four that came up in a random internet search. It seemed like every company that had the ability to manufacture a couple of you know, circuits and some wiring and put a couple of resistors in there, boom, they were making a Pong console. Uh, the successors to the original Magnavox Odyssey were even just Pong consoles. So you ever look up and you see an Odyssey 1000, 2000, 3000, 500, it's a Pong console. The world didn't need 50, 60, 70 Pong consoles in a year. I mean, seriously, if these things cost the equivalent of $50 to $100 today, could you imagine going to a store and seeing 30 different versions of one game console available that just played the one game? You know, buy an Xbox 360 and it has Halo 3 built in and that's it. And they've got 12 different versions of it, all priced differently, all looking different. You're just going to scratch your head like, what? So, same thing here. Uh, by 76, the market for Pong consoles had bottomed out, which is arguably the first true video game crash. Uh, and I just want to add in a note that the anger video game nerd, who fans of him, had done an episode about Pong consoles. I strongly suggest looking it up if you aren't a fan of his or haven't seen it yet. It shows the mass of random Pong consoles out there. So we move on to the microcomputer revolution and the first console wars. Now by the late 1970s, integrated circuits, the computer chips as we think of them, computer cores, had started to become common. Uh, Intel, MOS technologies, etc. had started to devise these complex little packages that could do all the math that it used to take a mainframe system to do. Uh, this created the home computer revolution, which also benefited the home video game market. You have things like the Apple II, Commodore Pet, Commodore 64 coming along the PC market. Now this also means you're going to have very simplified home game consoles. Uh, lots of companies wanted to bring more diverse, more powerful consoles to the home market, and this spawned the first console war. And here's the part where things get more standardized in the panel, where we'll basically go through consoles and list the details of them. First thing we've got in 76 is the Fairchild Channel F. Uh, this is the first console to actually use programmable ROM cartridges as compared to the Odyssey, which had all the programming built in. You couldn't add anything extra to that, even though Ralph Baer wanted to. He had ideas for it, they never came to be. Fairchild Channel F, as long as you could write for the processor in it and you could work within the confines of the system, the limited RAM, the storage, you could make anything you wanted within reason. Um, it lacked in a game that really caught the attention to the mass market at the time. Most games at this time were sort of poor quality versions of arcade games that'd be out at the time. And this kind of becomes a common theme in the early days. But I mean, we're talking very simple due to it being very limited machines that had to be marketed out where people could actually afford them. It was a very graphically limited system and had really unique controllers even for its time. I don't think any homebrew games exist for the Fairchild Channel F. I will have to double check that though. Um, if you see down there the controllers, and I'm so glad that's actually a crisp enough image. It's got the little triangular thing on top. That rotates, kind of like a Pong controller would. It tilts like we think of a regular joystick going. And you pull it in and out. So, yeah. You try figuring it out for that, it has no action button, so you're still basically getting Pong, and any game that can take advantage of that kind of input. So let your mind run with that one. Again, look up some games if you're curious. It's great. 
Next was with the RCA Studio 2, which was released in January 1977. It was already an obsolete console when it was released. It lacked dedicated controllers, instead using controls on the console, like a Pong console would, you know, similar to a phone number pad. So this continued in 1978 due to terrible sales, and I think we can all tell why. I mean, just look at it. I actually didn't include it originally, and yesterday morning I was like, I've got to include it, people will get a chuckle. This thing, RCA shouldn't have even bothered, but like I said, every company was going for making games. What do you expect? So, we move on to the Atari VCS, or the 2600. It was released in late 1977. It was designed originally just to play some Kong and tank type games. It wasn't the first game system to use cartridges, but was the first successful one. The things about this console, it's kind of unique compared to anything else. It had extremely limited RAM, which was common for computers at the time, but we're talking 128 bytes. We're talking nothing. You can barely fit the sentence I'm saying right now in that much storage, and I don't think you can could with this add-on RAM. It did use a stripped-down version of the then common 6502 processor, which, yeah, I'm sure I've had a custom order this. I love the processor, so many things used it. Um, it's really limited though in that the images on the screen had to be drawn in real time. Televisions operate, at least the classic ones, by a scan line system of just draw to beam, draw to beam, draw to beam, draw line really quickly, so fast you don't notice it. Yeah, the Atari 2600 had to basically calculate what needed to be drawn at that moment. So normally a computer will store an image and draw it all at once. This thing was doing it in real time. But this weakness actually proved to be beneficial. Um, it allowed developers to actually go and do crazy color changes, rainbow patterns, and go past the limitations of the system itself. I don't want to spend too much time on the 2600. I could be here all day talking about it. It's one of my favorite consoles of the pre-NES era. Um, but with Atari making a lot of arcade games as well, it only makes sense. Take your arcade games, make a home version of them. So with that alone, the console started to pick up in sales. We have the Odyssey 2, a proper sequel to the original Magnavox Odyssey, released in 78. It was intended to be both a home game console and a computer to compete with the Atari VCS. But it too was a limited machine, not as limited as the 2600, but very simple graphics. And it couldn't get the really popular arcade games at the time. Those were made by Atari. Magnavox isn't going to get Atari's games, so they basically stuck to making inferior clones up till the system was discontinued in 84. And I feel like I should have brought some pictures, but again, look them up. There's a Space Invaders clone that plays uniquely, but you wonder how Magnavox did get sued over it. It's clearly Space Invaders. Move on to the Mattel Television, released in 1980. Yes, Mattel, the same people who make Barbie. I told you, everyone was making video games back then. Had a really odd sort of disc controller, fire buttons on the side, and a number pad. It's not a phone. Why does it have a number pad? But it gave you some options, and the game sport do take good advantage of this. It uses little overlays to indicate that, oh, two is now, you know, have the plane move up or move down, or this button is this special option. Now, they created some interesting games. It was a pretty powerful console for its time. But, again, it didn't really come to uh, its full potential. They planned to have it be convertible into a full-on computer, but that never happened. Um, one of the interesting notes, though, is that there was actually a downloadable game service for it using what was the then new cable TV service. Uh, I think it was called Play Cable, and yeah, you had the option of downloading games that were basically broadcast at certain times if you had it on, and as long as you had your system on, you could play these games. So, you know, before there was DLC, before there was Sega Channel, there was the television and Play Cable. Lastly, for this generation, we have the ColecoVision, which was released in 1982. It was very similar to the arcade game hardware of the era, and it's considered to have the best home versions of arcade games from the 1980s. Uh, it was also a very expensive console compared to the uh, 2600, and it's still expensive in the market. The uh, average going price for one is between $100 and $200, so for something that's older than most of us in the room, including me, that's, that, that's something. This is one of the few points where I'll focus on games because this is very critical for this purpose. Um, major arcade releases of the 80s, you got Space Invaders, which really was like 78, 79, Donkey Kong, and Pac-Man. Now, Space Invaders was the first killer app, or big system seller for the 2600. 
Um, Atari fought hard to get the rights to it. They did, and that sold the console towards 1980. Uh, it was very early port to the system, and it was really hard to port over. Limitations of the 2600, limited number of sprites it could uh, actually put on there, resulted in them having to do some clever programming tricks with it. Um, Donkey Kong became the pack-in game for the ColecoVision with its release, and I think for most of its life was the pack-in game, and that's a pretty good version of Donkey Kong. And lastly, uh, we have Pac-Man Engine, which we'll cover that. Um, lesser game consoles, as I said, would have to resort to clones of these games. Um, for Pac-Man, for example, the Magnavox Odyssey 2 has a little game called Casey Munchkin uh, Crazy Chase. It's different, but it's very much a Pac-Man clone. So, Magnavox actually got sued over it. And they lost, so. Try to sue Atari over Pong, Atari settles out of court. Magnavox gets sued by Namco, Magnavox loses. What are you gonna do? It's probably why they basically said forget it to video games after the crash. So we move on to a little bit of comparison. Up top we have the arcade version of uh, Space Invaders, and beside that we have the 2600 version. I don't know how well you can make it out because it'd be hard to see even on my end, but there's little lines between the Atari Space Invaders. They did a trick of alternately drawing them on lines, which gave them sort of a like a wireframe kind of appearance, but uh, it did the job of breaking the limitation of only being able to draw a couple of characters on screen at once, so clever programming saved the day. Down at the bottom for uh, Donkey Kong, we have the arcade version of uh, Donkey Kong, the ColecoVision version, and the 2600 version, where Donkey Kong is a gingerbread man, apparently. <laughs> so, you know, I do find it funny that the ColecoVision version has them uh, swap sides, but I think that was just like a mirror, but I, I think that was just a design fluke, and you know, it is what it is. So we move on to the winner of who got the uh, license for Pac-Man, Atari. Look at that happy game, doesn't that look like a fun game? You know, Atari would win the license to make the home version of Pac-Man, which was the biggest game of the time. You think of age arcades, you're thinking Pac-Man. There's probably people who have had, in this room who have played Pac-Man this year, probably this month at some point. So, we all love it. We all know it. And, you know, this is the game we want to get. You know, you're in the edition. You want Pac-Man, right? You hear it's coming for the Atari. You'd be excited, right? Everyone excited? Yeah, Pac-Man. Coming to the 2600. There's your Pac-Man on the 2600. <laughs> this is why you don't rush a game. This is the problem we're dealing with today, is rushed games. So there's almost nothing like Pac-Man in the arcade, and it didn't play much better. Needless to say, when this was released, Atari wanted to recoup their cost of getting the license. So this became the Pac-Man game, releasing Combat, their tank game, with the 2600 sold in 82, 83-ish. Back when the system started to get really affordable. Oddly, good versions exist on the Atari home computers, the Commodore computers, and the successor to the 2600, which was the Atari 5200. Everyone's somewhere deep down crying on the inside here in <laughs> This was basically the Atari 8-bit home computer line. It used an analog controller, so Missile Command. You all know the game where the missiles are coming down and you move the cursor. Instead of having to move and wait and hold and hope that you got there in time, if you moved over all the way, it would be over there that quick. That's the kind of design they were thinking with this analog control. With Centipede, you move over to the side real quick. The little, uh, they're playing as Garden Gnome with Centipede, oddly. You move on over. It was a great idea. Control was terrible. I own 5200. I own quite a few of these consoles, as you'd probably expect. If I want to play it, I have to take the controller apart, the one working controller I have, and clean every single contact in it. <laughs> they used a poor quality contact, like, material, and it oxidizes quickly, you know, no. it's, it, 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 it. so imagine your controller basically rusting up on electric, that's what happens, so, it doesn't work, it don't work, it don't want to work, there's an angry video game nerd episode on the 5200, it's an early one, but also a good one, um, it was designed to replace the 2600, but failed miserably, um, part of this reason is that it didn't play 2600 games. You think backwards compatibility is a big issue these days with the Playstations and the Xboxes and the like? No, it was a big deal back then. People were like, I've got all these games, I bought the new system, why can't I play it on them? 
Atari eventually released an adapter, but it was too little too late. We're talking two years after the console's release, during the heydays of the crash. in a second. I actually like that game, so I, I had to put it up there. This is symbolic of the video game crash. By 1984, video game sales began to dwindle as consumers lost confidence in the quality of the products they were offered. Pac-Man was bad enough, but E.T., one of the hottest movies of the 80s. All these kids want to get E.T. game, want to get E.T. game. And they get it, and they can't figure it out. Like I said, I like E.T. as a game. I really do. Of course, I switch it to a later mode where all the other people, the FBI agents, scientists, aren't chasing after you. It becomes a little scavenger hunt. The game makes sense, but it makes sense looking at it like it was an early Nintendo game rather than a 2600 title. You think of the Atari, you're thinking of arcade games, quick one-screen shooters and the like, or little, fly, little uh, adventure games. E.T. was incredibly complex in a good way. It had its bugs because it was rushed, just like Pac-Man was super rushed. So I'm not saying it's a great game, but a lot of people unfairly blame it alone. It was a lot of other factors. E.T. being complex was sort of an icing on the cake thing. The fact that the 2600 used a 6502 based processor, one of the most common ones of the era, meant that anyone who was skilled in programming for it could, in theory, you know, program for it. And Atari didn't control the production of games for the system. They couldn't. They tried to sue a company that you may know, Activision, back when it started in the early 80s. It was a bunch of Atari programmers who didn't like the fact that they weren't getting credit for their games. You know, no program by, you know, David Crane or anything, just it was an Atari game. So they said, Toodles, we'll do our own. And uh, Atari tried to sue over it. And of course decided, no, anyone who can program, it's common technology. They do not take any kind of special stuff to program for it. They, they have the rights to do it. So. Atari had no control over it. Um, this opened the gates to all kinds of third-party companies that just could not make quality games. They refused to. You know, you can put out a game for 20 bucks, it's put out. Why not? Who cares, right? This leads to a lot of really interesting games for the system, but that's what killed it. When everyone can make a terrible game for the console, and you're the consumer, you're the parent in the 80s going out and buying these games, how are you going to know that Fast Food is a good game, that Atlantis is a good game, that World War One is okay. I'm trying to think of some actual terrible ones, because all the ones I've listed are good. <laughs> oh, man. You know, how are you supposed to know, though, really? Do you even know what half those games are about? Fast Food, do you even know what it is? I don't think anyone here does. And that's expected. It's a great game, but how are you going to know? You're a mouth-eating food, by the way. Like, no joke. <laughs> um, look that one up. I did, a, I did a video review of it on a side project, so if you find that video, awesome. Um, but yeah, so Atari itself was forced to liquidate inventories. There's rumors of massive burials, especially of multitudes of cartridges. Hey, if that and ClecoVision basically could play all the Atari games. There was an adapter for the ClecoVision. I did fail to add that in. That was a fully engineered Atari 2600. So you can control you can, everything. You can use the controller, you can play everything. <laughs> Yes, yes, there was a Space Invaders, I forgot about that, Space Invaders variant where it was Coke attacking Pepsi. Yes, Space Invaders, that was, that's a trip right there. Even though uh, E.T. probably did take a big role in the game, there's still the Atari. You got to also remember that E.T. also had Easter eggs in it. Yes, yes it did. It had references to Howard Scott Warshaw's previous games. Interestingly enough, the same guy programmed E.T., Howard Scott Warshaw, also made one of the best games for the Atari 2600, Yars Revenge. You're a space fly in that one. It was the 80s. Good time. Good time. Once Upon Atari, great documentary to watch. Uh, they'll give you an idea on just how uh, crazy things were. Cold month. What was it? What was it? Howard Scott Warshaw or somebody who was crawling along the walls or something? Attacked it. Or no, the guy who did Spider Man was crawling along the walls and Howard Scott Warshaw cracking a bull whip walking down the halls just to get in character for programming Indiana Jones game. It's some crazy stuff. You gotta love it. Um, so now we hit the point of Act 5, we're hitting 84, 85, 86 range, Japan meets America. In 1983, Nintendo released the Family Computer or Famicom. 
uh, home video game system in Japan. They wanted to release a version for the United States, and originally were talking with Atari to release such, but the game crash naturally caused such talks to fall through. Nintendo would, however, redesign the Famicom, naming it the Nintendo Entertainment System, and marketing it as a home entertainment device and a toy, rather than a game console. So, I don't know how many of you may have heard of this one, it's kind of obscure, you know, kind of rare. I think I might have seen one that was a little broken one time, you know. Wait for the sarcasm. So, the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES, and I'm one of those weirdos who pronounces it like the Brits do, NES. I love that pronunciation. Most people will say NES after their account character. It is what it is, tomato, tomato. <laughs> Test market in 1985 and released in 86. Game mass popularity in 1987, which was a great year for gaming. It was designed to look like a VCR of the era, hence the odd uh, cartridge insertion type with the you know, slot loading, pushing down that half the time didn't work. Turns out us leaving our games in there as kids is what caused it to ruin. If you boil the connector, it works fine. No kidding, boil it, fix it, fix it back up. Yeah, take part of the system, but hey, it's fine. Um, they wanted to market it, as I said, like a toy. And they wanted to avoid the um, top-loading cartridge design that was prevalent in the Ataris. Uh, it really was just an Atari thing. ColecoVision and television used side-loading cards, but still, you want to make it look as much like a VCR as possible. So, ditch the top-loading design. We don't want it marketed as a video game. Video games, well, no, no. Arcades held up okay, but home games, they're a fad. They're done with. It's like Pong. It's over, man. So they market it as a toy have Rob the Robot in the main deluxe set. Rob was only used for two games, Gyromite and Stagma, or Robot Gyro and Robot Block if you put the games in. Because quick ports of, you know, random Japanese titles would go from here. So they sold it as a toy, and it worked. It became popular. This really, though, is due to the more unique design of the games, where we all know things like Super Mario Brothers, Legend of Zelda, Castlevania, the, the ideas that Japanese developers took this hardware, which, oddly enough, is still 6502 based, just throwing that geeky tidbit out there. <laughs> and, you know, they rolled with it. People loved it. So we move on to the Sega Master System, which was the latest version of Sega's SG console series in Japan, released to North America in 86, and was technically superior to the Famicom and NES, but was nowhere near as popular in the States as the NES was. The system, though, is still in production in Brazil. It's a different companies <laughs> as I say. I can't you not. Talk to someone from Brazil. They obsess over the Master System. It's much the same as we love the NES, as generally that is the system we think of when you think of American vintage retro gaming. Brazil, there's still companies that make it, but you can still buy Sega Genesis variants today, so go figure. Yeah, so it's interesting where these things become popular. Um, game library was limited in the U.S. due to a near borderline illegal policy Nintendo had at the time. That little Nintendo seal of quality, the one we all love to see, that was partly to avoid the software crash, or the software bloke that caused the crash in 1984, the English Chris, if you speak it. Nintendo set up a policy where they alone manufactured the actual game card. They limited each publisher to 10 games a year so that they would focus on the quality of the games over the quantity in the U.S. Now how LJN managed to make so many games is beyond me, but <laughs> hey, spend your money on licenses, you're going to put them out. Jaws, Friday the 13th, which I actually like Friday the 13th. On and on. All the movie licenses. LJN, that lovely rainbow. <laughs> <sighs> They also think publishers agree not to release that game on a competitor's console for a period of two years after its release on the NES. So you can imagine how this will uh, cause problems for something. Imagine nowadays where you've got some exclusive games like the new Tomb Raider being exclusive to the Xbox uh, for a limited time, we believe, I'm not sure. Uh, the Final Fantasy VII remake, ooh. Uh, that being limited to the PlayStation uh, 4, 3, 4, 4, 4, only 4, for a time. Um, yeah, imagine if that was a two or three year period mandatorily, and nowadays you can kind of deal with it, but back then, consoles couldn't make it on their own without that third party support. That was the thing that made the 2600 great. All these companies making good games for it, but then it doomed it with all the companies making bad. This did keep the game quality on the NES somewhat better than it would have been on the Atari, but still bad games were rampant. 
And some publishers, uh, like Konami, use puppet labels to publish more than 10 games a year. That's why Ultra Games exists, if you ever look at that, like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, I think Skater Dial is one of them, a few others. They're just Konami games, rebranded. That's all. So they usually use it for their harder games, but with Konami back in those days, judging harder is, you know. Yeah, Castlevania, come on. Okay, so I've got a whole 10 minutes. So we're going to have to rush, rush, rush here, so apologize. Tar 7800. Yeah, Atari made another one. This was planned to be released in 1984, but the crash saw it held back until 86. The system had really only modernized versions of arcade classics, again, being planned for 84 to pre-crash pre era, like the quality adventure titles and styles found on the NES. It was an amazing system and could play 2600 games, but failed in the market against Nintendo. It was too little too late in game design, but it's a personal favorite of mine. The games that are for it are really, really fun. Ish. Depends on your mood. I was thinking about asteroids and I'm like, just playing the arcade. Anyway, we'll move on to the Sega Genesis, known as the Mega Drive outside of the US, released in Japan in 87 and the US in 89. It was the first mainstream 16 bit home console. The Intellivision was actually a 16 bit console as well, whereas all the others were 8 bit. Basically, handles twice as much data per, you know, computer or processor doing its thing. Uh, but it was limited though, so we'll leave nowhere into it. Uh, began to cut down on Nintendo's dominance in the game market, which at this time, back in 89, was 90 plus percent. So all the other Sega and the like, they had a little niche market. Here we hit the lovely thing that, in retrospect, to call the Big Wars, which also led to the second great console wars. Sega was taken away from Nintendo's market share, and marketing was based on the Genesis being a more powerful system than the older 8-bit NES. You know, last processing, guys. <laughs> totally. Look at them with megapixels and stuff. So, we hit arguably Nintendo's answer. I mean, it was an inevitable release. The Super Nintendo, released in 1990 in Japan and in 1991 in the United States. So you can tell they really wanted to get this console out there to everyone. Nintendo's 60 bit uh, console had a slower, still 6502 based processor. And it was probably one of the last major uses of that kind of processor. So that 30, 40 year computer legacy started coming to an end with the Super Nintendo. It was slower than the Genesis processor, which was faster, sure, so last processing arguably was true, but all the other aspects of the console were superior. The sound, the graphics capability, the act, even the controller. Three buttons versus, what is it, eight? Come on. If you play Super Nintendo games, you know how in depth those controls get. It set a, pre a precedent for every controller we have, you know, these days. Um, Basically continued uh, the big wars and the console wars. Nintendo fans stayed loyal, Sega fans sticking by their already aging console. So well against the Genesis, but couldn't regain the uh, Nintendo's 1980 dominance. Uh, part of this is cited as Sonic the Hedgehog alone selling a lot of Sega Genesis consoles. That game was a big deal back then. I remember being a kid and being like Sonic, 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 Sonic. I still love the games. The older ones, not the new ones. That's the thing. Here we have the Sega CD. It was a CD add-on released for the Genesis in the U.S. in 1992. A lot of games have been published using the full 700 megabyte CD-ROM rather than the limited uh, one or two megs that a uh, cartridge can handle, but failed on a whole due to most games for the system being interactive movies rather than more popular platformers and traditional games. Philips CDI and 3DO. I can't wait to I know, I know. Some of you are dying on the inside. I'm so hungry, I could eat an Octorok. <laughs> <laughs> also, what is with Link wanting to bomb the Dongos? I don't, I don't like that. I, I, mean, I imagine him just going crazy. It's like, no, dude, no, you're crazy. Let them live, sick with the Dongos. Nina has a shirt. Someone make it happen. Both were CD based consoles and were intended to become home entertainment systems. Think of VCR DVD players were. CDI was in 91, 3DO was in 93. CDI was originally a planned CD add-on to the Sega Genesis, but the contract fell through. Uh, CDI actually had some Nintendo titles published, but they were terrible. Worth checking out if you're not aware of them. Again, before mentioned, Zelda CDIs. And um, Mar Mario's Hotel being wonderful. It's actually a good enough game, but yeah. Interestingly, 3DO was a very early 32-bit system. And we've got five minutes, so I'm going to rush, rush, rush. So, forgive me.
Get the 32X, released in 94, was an add-on for Genesis, which gave it a 32-bit processor. Complicated as anything to hook up to the system. We're talking, you've got to plug it into the wall outlet, as well as your TV, as well as the Genesis, and the Sega CD, if you wanted to play the games that were CD-based and use the 32X as well. We're talking two add-ons for a console that have a decent market share. Come on. It failed. It was a stopgap before uh, the release of Sega's next console. We had Atari's last attempt in the main game market, the Atari Jaguar in 93. Marketed as a 64-bit system, was really a very complex 32-bit system with multiple processors. Had poor quality games, most likely due to difficulty, difficulty in programming for such a system, failed in the market. Had its own CD add-on. CDs were just the biggest thing in the early 90s, I swear, I still remember it. It was terrible as expected, but the worst part about it is, it had an effective chips process for it. They were cheap. Sometimes the thing just refused to work. We're talking deader than dead. So go figure, you buy a $200 Jaguar add-on for CDs and it doesn't even work. Hit the uh, Act 6, the 32-bit era, and onward, 95 to 2000. Moved to the Sega Saturn, released in 95, discontinued in 98. Sega's first true 32-bit console, but was complex to code for, much like the Atari Jaguar. Had quality games with a lot of popular Sega arcade games being ported over, but failed in the market due to just the competition from its, uh, comp the competition from its competitors. It was an expensive little console, very limited third-party support, which is a doom, a doom sense to any console. Move on to the Sony PlayStation. I think it's the actual name, yes. Uh, Sony's first game console, released in 95, 32-bit system with a pretty you know, streamlined design. You write for one processor, you write for stuff. She's playing Spyro right now, so Spyro. Which was really designed to be an add-on for the Super Nintendo, and I know we've all heard the news of the, you know, Super Nintendo uh, prototype. The PlayStation Super Famicom prototype being found was originally intended to play DVDs back in 95 when DVD was a brand new technology, hence the name PlayStation. Uh, cheaper than the sector, leading to its success. We the <laughs> Not that big not that a fan of it. <laughs> Released in 96, it was a 64-bit system, but most games ran only in a 32-bit mode. Used cartridges instead of CDs, limiting the storage. Was somewhat complicated code for, but programmers had good skill with it. Nintendo was real good on supporting them with it, so even though it was kind of hard to program for, they made it happen. Uh, had an odd controller that seems strange today, but in the early days of 3D, it makes sense. We have all played a lot of 64 games clearly from the yeah. round <laughs> I enjoy it. It's just there's only a few games I really, really like on it. Most of the library is kind of and to me, but that's just me. Those were good, rare, yes. Next, we have Sega Dreamcast. Released in 99, discontinued in 2001. Sega's last console marked the end of the bit wars, so to speak. High-end 32-bit system, a uh, modified version was used for a lot of Sega arcade games of the time. Hence, the quality arcade ports to the Dreamcast in the same vein as the Saturn had its own quality ports. Lacked some uh, third-party support, though, but it did pretty good on its own. And, uh, Sega couldn't recoup the money they were losing after the uh, Saturn. They had seriously lost a lot of money in the tail end of the Genesis and the Saturn era, so they had to discontinue it in early 2001. Did have dial up uh, network connectivity, so some of your first console online play that was like uh, built into the console. So, there you go. Um, pretty much failed in the market, relatively speaking, but um, you know, you obviously like it. This is 2000, successfully original PlayStation, play DVDs, use a complex 120 bit custom processor designed to give characters better emotions, but good software development kits. Company could, uh, developers could work with it. Did have its own ability for uh, online play through a later released uh, network adapter. Came with, uh, let's see, had a hard drive expansion as well that came with Final Fantasy XI here in the States. So, you know, it, it had its online uh, market. I've got a whole 40, 20 seconds. We get the Xbox. Had a built in online play. The name comes from the Microsoft Protocol for Computers, DirectX, Direct Xbox. There's its name. Can we, can we rush through like 12 consoles in a minute? Let's go. Genesis disc based system, released in 2001, sold moderately well behind the PlayStation 2. Very good price for its time, good quality games. I would say there's nothing too special about it, but I mean that in a good way. There's also nothing really bad about it. I like it. Oddly, one of the systems I don't have. 
We move on to the HD generation of gaming. Xbox 360 yeah. sets up online gaming as a, as a heavy, heavy standard. Use basically the same processor as the PS3, obviously yeah. yeah. the down version of it. System had high failure rates due to uh, rushed design, but uh, they fixed it. As time went on, they fixed it. Launched, but had full backwards compatibility. Originally, with PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 1 games, was a Blu ray player when Blu ray was still new and expensive. Uh, the Xbox 360 went with HD DVD, and we all know where that went. Uh, later, hardware versions lost the compatibility to play PS2 games, but they were cheaper to make, so they sold for less. The console was expensive. Uh, PS3 set up online gaming as a standard for the PlayStation legacy. Yeah. 2006. Heavy use of motion controls for game became a true family console. Everyone wanted one. We all remember the big 2006, 2007, the Russian World Week. Best selling console of all time, which makes Wii Sports the most common video game on the planet. More than Mario 3. Yeah! Fun fact GameStop still wants $20 for Wii Sports. No. <laughs> most common game in the world, $20. Go figure. They'll give you two cents for it. <laughs> um, Console had a big sort of, I hate to say that it was a fad, but it really was. It started to be trend for motion controls being a thing that we're still kind of leaning off of. Yeah, what do most people's Wii's do nowadays if you go to someone, uh, someone's house? They play dust. Sad fact. We're going to hyper rush because I'm already overdue on timing and such. Connect to PlayStation Move, done as reactionary measures for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. For the motion controls, they are what they are. I think we all know it. We want to the Wii U. Oh, yeah. You already know, I don't need to tell you about it. I don't think I need to rush through any of these, but you see how far I went. We go to the Wii U, we go yeah, to the PlayStation 4, sure. oh yeah, and then we land on the Xbox One. I like my Xbox One. Your credit card company sure loves that I bought it. <laughs> At least they're fixing their problems. I did want to do Q&A, but this took longer. I'm going to be hanging out. I'm not doing much after this. If y'all want to talk, Q&A, whatever, outside in the hall. I'm down for it. Thank you all for coming. Y'all are awesome!